Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying your day with us today. Welcome to our breakout session, Our Digital Workforce. My name is Sofia Sanchez, and I am a current so CHCI Social Equity Public Policy Fellow. Now, as someone whose entire college experience was kind of marred by shifting changes in, in digital um, atmospheres from online classes to social media to expecting to enter a remote workforce, I'm so glad we're having the time to make this have this conversation today. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Accenture, Micron, Dell Technologies, and Capital One for their generous support of this breakout session. The nature of American work has changed drastically in the past few years. From digital nomads logging on to remote work, to the use of robotics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence across all sectors, no aspect of the workforce has remained the same with the rapid changes in technological advancement. Today we will hear a rich discussion on how employers are building alternative models to attract and retain the um, diverse talent to meet the shifting challenges of a digital workforce, and how the future of work will ensure the economic and professional success of Latino communities. Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome, introduce our welcoming remarks from Micron. Please welcome Susanna Steen to, th to the floor. Hello, good morning. I'm Susanna Steen, Director for Community and Academic Rel Relations for Micron Technology. And um, on behalf of Micron, I just wanted to say it's, it's a pleasure for us to be able to support such a worthwhile event. Micron, if you have not heard of us, if you have, can you raise your hand if you've heard of, like, of Micron and what we do? We are a semiconductor company, uh, the fourth largest um, semiconductor company in the world. We make memory. So thank you for taking photos, recording videos. You are actually helping to drive our business with that, so we thank you. And um, in order for us to have all the, the memory that your gadgets need, that your vehicles need, we need to have technical workforce. We are spread across 17 different countries with more than 40,000 team members, and then across many states here in the United States. Um, my specific location here is, in, um, is here in Northern Virginia. And so we know that not only need, we need to have the technical talent, we also need to have a diverse talent. And we live it every day. And so in Virginia, for example, um, we have very robust Micron Hispanic Professionals group, and I'm glad that we had our chair here last spring for, um, for your event, who was talking um, on Micron's behalf and um, was participating here, and her and some colleagues will be going to a school this Thursday to talk about different engineering careers uh, with our high schoolers in a school district where the majority is Latinos, actually 65% um, are Latinos there. So, um, our MHP groups, they select their charities and schools that they want to support every year through monetary donations as well as uh, through volunteering. And so that is something that they have done. And most recently, it's been the American uh, Latino Veterans Association that they have adopted. So it's, it's a pleasure for me to work um, with MHP as well as with other uh, employee resource groups that we have and support these initiatives and activities. And I wish you great rest of your um, your day, your event here. I look forward to the conversations and glad we can be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for your engaging opening remarks. Now let's begin our conversation. To facilitate this panel, we are delighted to have Liliana and now Holmes as our moderator for this session. Liliana Anau Holmes is a Mexican-Colombian journalist, media professional, and passionate storyteller with more than 25 years of experience. She is also the winner of an Emmy and is a three times nominee to the prestigious Academy Award. Currently, Ms. Anau Holmes is dedicated to Ideal2 Media, the bilingual communications firm she started here, co-founded here in Washington, DC. Please welcome Liliana Anau Holmes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. I know. Are you awake? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Buenos dias. Good morning. Yes. That's what I expect. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, I am delighted, honored, and it is a pleasure to be here. Um, it had been a while, if we're going to talk about the pandemic, where I had the opportunity to be, to be here in person. So it is a joy to engage in person with you guys this morning. Um, 
thank you to Micron for setting up the stage for our conversation this morning. And Sophia, thank you so much uh, for your introduction, CHCI for hosting this tech summit for the invitation. Thank you all for making this happen. So now let's talk about COVID and let's talk about the pandemic. Um, when COVID-19 struck, it forced many societal changes around the globe, as we know. Nearly overnight, government and businesses issued orders that limited large gatherings of people, restricted in-person business operations, and encouraged people to work from home as much as possible. Businesses and schools found ways and had to find ways to continue their operations remotely thanks to the internet. Even prior to this life-altering event, technology had become an increasingly important part of the workforce. Businesses were looking at technology not only as a helpful means of engaging with customers, but one that would also allow for workplace flexibility and for a way to introduce digital workforce hiring practices and faster processes. I am delighted to be um, joined by four experts that will help us explore and tackle this very topic and address what those hiring practices are and what best practices came from those new learnings. During our discussion today, we will be taking questions from the audience later in the program. I will cue you to that. And of course, we also welcome you to follow the discussion and spread the word on social media using the hashtag CHCI Summit. Got the hashtag? Excellent. So like I said, I, I am honored. We hadn't met in person, so I am so delighted to meet you guys. I've read about you. And you know, these are Latinos representing us in the tech world. Can we, can we give them a round of applause? Applause, <laughs> Latinos. Um, and um, we are just so happy that you join us today to share your expertise this morning. And I'm going to allow you now. Please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the company you represent. Sorry, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, and uh, again, I'm honored to be invited to, to sit on the panel today with uh, some esteemed colleagues. And so hopefully we have a, a robust conversation and uh, can get to each other then we'll talk some a little bit better. Uh, I am Ed Moya. I, I serve as the Senior Vice President of Human Resources uh, at Dell Technology. I've been at the company for 30 years. Yes, 30 years. And so uh, I'm one of the senior statesmen at Dell. Uh, uh, born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Uh, uh, went to the University of Texas at Austin, and I moved to Austin in the early 80s, and I never left. And I had the, the fortunate opportunity right after uh, university to, to uh, meet an individual who was at, uh, at Dell Technologies, or Dell Computer back then. And I was offered a job back then. And 30 years later, uh, you know, I've uh, been Extremely fortunate and extremely blessed to be with, uh, with such a great company and, and obviously with a, uh, a very unique, still founder-led chairman and CEO in Michael Dell, who is a great visionary for our, for our industry and a great leader for our company. So again, thank you and I'm honored to be here. Happy to have you. Now we have Jennifer Lopez. Sure. Hi everyone, Jennifer Lopez. I work at Capital One. I've been there for 10 years. Currently, I work on the venture investing team overseeing new venture development. Before that, I ran our innovation lab for a few years and was hired into the company to introduce design there. So 10 year, 10 year at Capital One. Prior to that, I was an entrepreneur, an artist, a maker of all sorts, which hopefully I'll get to talk a little bit about today. And really excited to be here. And I get to run Hispanics in Technology, which is a large organization of Capital One in support of our Latinos in tech, developing them, and also bringing up the new generation of technologists. And I have a passion around making more Latino technologists. The Latino population in America, 18.9%. The number of Latinos in tech, 8%. It's a big gap. So excited to talk to you all about closing. I love that. Thank you so much. Jamie. Hi, everybody. Um, Jamie Maldonado, so excited to be here with you guys today. Um, I have been at Accenture for 12 years. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. Um, who would have known that a first-gen Puerto Rican from the mountains of Puerto Rico would have ended up up here in front of you guys. And so if I can, so can anyone else end up in technology. Um, my undergrad is actually international relations and economics from Tufts. How did I end up in technology? Because I knew I wanted to be in business and because I knew technology would be a big part of business 
and technologists and CIOs need to understand how to get the most out of technology. And so that's what led me here. Um, I got my MBA along the way, um, and I've been at Accenture for 12 years, like I mentioned. I'm also the North America lead for our Hispanic American ERG. And I have a big, big passion for showing everybody else that anybody can be a part of technology and Latinos deserve a seat at the table. And guess what? We need to be at the table to, so that technology in the future will represent all of us as well. So we can get into that in a little bit, but super excited to be with you guys today. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Great. Good morning. I'm Brent Wilkes. I'm the Senior Vice President for Institutional Development for Hispanic Federation. And I've been with the organization now for four years. Hispanic Federation is a 32-year-old organization that started in New York. Um, we are a membership-driven organization, so our members are other Latino nonprofit organizations around the country. We've since grown to now uh, 41 states, and we have um, over 500 institutional members that are part of the Hispanic Federation. Before I started with the Federation, I was with the League of United Latin American Citizens and was there for 30 years ultimately serving as the executive director and CEO of the organization. And I helped um, uh, there uh, open up 88 technology centers to introduce um, uh, digital skilling and technology classes to Latino communities across the country. Um, at the Federation, I've been doing the same thing. We now have uh, 42 digital skilling centers that really work on trying to equip Latinos with the latest skill sets that employers are demanding. I, I guess one stat, since we all threw out a stat, about half of all Latinos need to upskill their digital skill set to be competitive in today's economy, and about 90% of new jobs that are being created do require some type of digital skilling. So this sector is super important, and it's really incre incredibly important that we address this shortfall of Latino uh, Latinos um, graduating with digital skill sets. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you all again, and bienvenidos once again. So I will throw out questions, mm -hmm. and let's have this as a coffee table conversation. If you feel like jumping in, you don't need to wait for it you know, to be addressed. Um, but let's talk about COVID-19. And generally speaking, obviously, it acted as a catalyst for us to identify many challenges, but also opportunities or challenges that may be turned into opportunities. So as it relates to the digital workforce, what did it spark in your experience? What did we glean from it? And where might we improve. Um, I'm going to start by saying, uh, Brent, I'm familiar with the Hispanic Federation. I had the, the pleasure to work with Frankie before and talk about the things that you guys did. So from the kindergartner whose kindergarten experience was through a computer monitor, you know, through the senior executive who maybe didn't have the skills, the technical skills to maneuver the transition, what 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 did we learn from it? What did we get from it, and what could we improve? Well, we certainly learned that not having the access to technology and the digital skill sets was really a, a difficult thing for the Latino community. Um, the unemployment rate, uh, for example, for for Latinos just skyrocketed during the pandemic initially. That was because a lot of Latinos are in the types of occupations that had to shut down. Um, during the pandemic um, and when the, all the closures, the restaurants were closed and all, all these types of things closed. And yet at the same time, there were Latinos that were out in the fields that were working in food processing that were deemed essential and had to keep going through that. And um, we had you know, very sky high rates of COVID infection, lots of, um, uh, unfortunately, lots of Latinos passed away, um, much higher than the rest of the population. So we really worked hard to try to address that with a pandemic relief campaign. Ultimately, we've donated about $35 million to Latino nonprofits around the country to really help uh, the community with, with um, pandemic-related um, you know, programs and, and you know, vaccination campaigns. Um, but one of the key things was this digital effort because the job sets that were able to work from home, the folks that the kids that were able to work uh, or to do distance learning from home were the ones that had that internet connectivity that um, were, were already kind of digital natives. And the families that didn't have that uh, broadband connection in their homes and the kids weren't so used to using um, internet um, in the home place really struggled during this time frame. Um, it's estimated now that Latinos have fallen about eight months behind their previous cohort um, because of that impact of not having that um, capability of hopping online during the pandemic. And so it's a huge challenge. Right now we're trying to catch back up again um, but I think a lot of us realize that this, you know, 
many of us realized this was important before. I think everybody agrees now that getting connected to the internet and having digital skill sets is absolutely essential um, for the ability to certainly do distance learning and remote work, but even access um, healthcare from, from home and other types of services. And so um, luckily, the Congress has appropriated uh, funds to uh, the, the BEAD program, which is this broadband um, uh, equity and deployment program, which is really going to be spreading internet across the country. It's over $80 billion that, that the Congress has invested in broadband deployment. So that's something that's super important. I think, I think we're really happy to see this investment being made. And we're working right alongside of these community-based organizations to make sure that we pinpoint, first of all, where this with these broadband networks should go and helping the, these nonprofits get connected and to skill up the folks that are going to be part of the program to make sure that um, you know we, our community does benefit from this historic investment by Congress. So, thanks. Excellent. From the digital workforce, uh, what did it spark? Well, so it was really clear for us at Capital One that like our investments in technology for everyone. Oh, I think your mic turned off. My mic turned off. Yeah. Let's change that. <laughs> Is it better? No. Yeah. Is it better? No, not better yet? No, I just flipped the switch. I can project also. Yeah. <laughs> we think you're on now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that I was most proud of working for Capital One is we'd invested really heavily in our technology beforehand. And not every company did that. And it was a foresight to believe that like you should make all of your workforce accessible. And I think that was one of the things that in those early days of the pandemic, when everyone went home, we said literally every single person, whether you're a contact center agent or a senior executive, had the ability to connect at home. And that was mission critical because on day one, we were all climbing a mountain together because we provide financial services. And I don't know about y'all, but my mom still goes to the bank branch. <laughs> so during the pandemic, there was a big concern about whether, whether or not a bunch of our customers were gonna get the services they needed. Bank branches were closing, not permanently, but just to manage this moment. Um, so I'm really proud that we worked with the Center for um, Aging, both in English and Spanish, to teach seniors how to use digital tools to bank. Because what we discovered is they're FaceTiming their kids, their, their grandkids, but they don't like paying bills online. Why is that? Because technology is scary. So we built a bunch of tools for them over the pandemic, and my team got to work on that. So when, when we talk about like what's changing the world, well, we did all that from home, and we were able to give our staff really mission-aligned work. We were making sure everybody's grandparents were getting access to banking tools. And those moments where you get to enable technology to do something really important for the world like changes everything. Jamie or Ed. Yeah, so uh, similar to uh, Capital One, Dell had started our flexible workforce, hybrid workforce, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, a decade before, more than a decade before, uh, really taking advantage of the, the fundamental concept of work is an outcome, uh, not a location, right? And, you know, in more and more as we looked at uh, you know, our ability to have people work in some form of a hybrid or fully remote, uh, it, it actually, we're, we were moving in that direction. Then the pandemic hit, and then 130,000 employees all of a sudden uh, were, were out in their homes. Uh, again, being a technology and an essential infrastructure company, uh, a technology company, we were, we were well healed in that. Now, obviously, we had a lot of things to do with uh, the ability to kind of increase the pipes in our intranets and things of that nature, like a lot of different companies. But uh, we moved and we pivoted fairly quickly. And, and then uh, we started partnering, obviously, with our partners and our customers around the world to gear them up for the, the exact same thing Dell was going through and any walk of life was going through working remote. Uh, so what we've learned from that is our team members are extremely resilient. Uh, we're very quick to pivot. Uh, we also learned that not every job uh, lends itself to that kind of work, right? So if you're an engineer in the engineering labs, if you're working uh, behind the scenes in cybersecurity in, in, in the white rooms, uh, you've got to be physically located. And then you take it on a global level. The American experience is a little bit unique to the extent that we've got a little bit of elbow, elbow room here. But you go into some countries and regions around the world 
where you might have a, a room this big and you have multiple generations of family living in that room and then try to work with that chaos. And so we've learned that we, we needed to be adaptable and flexible to our team members' needs and meet them where they were at and, and try to accommodate for that for the best. And then the other thing is, uh, while uh, video conferencing, Zoom technologies or whatever is a great enhancer uh, and a great productivity tool, there's also a darker side. It is a consumer of your time. It's, I don't know if you guys have reflected or, or if I know I have, my days all of a sudden went from fairly finite to expansive, especially for global organizations. Yeah. So your early mornings were early, your later nights were later, uh, and then you were able to book like nuts, right? <laughs> and so the, the whole concept of wellness, right, has become more and more relevant in our, in our organization to ensure that people are taking their breaks, they are getting up, they are doing other things. But, but again, the, the, the book isn't written yet. And the, you know, this pandemic, if, if anybody tells you they have it solved, they're, they're lying to you. Uh, it, it is evolving as we go along. But what we do know, similar to the, the commentary here, is technology and the access to technology is critical. Uh, our ability to democratize technology and get it in the hands of the people that need it uh, most, whether it's partners, customers, individuals, is mission critical to, to Dell and it's mission critical to, uh, in, ter in terms of our communities itself. So similarly, I think for us, we pivoted pretty quickly. 500,000 people went remote within a few days. It was, you guys remember March 2020, it was quite the time. Um, but there were a couple of things that came out of that. I think one of the things I'm really proud of is Accenture was a big part of a careers marketplace where companies could go and post. Remember, there were a lot of layoffs at the time too. We partnered with a number of companies and we stood up a website very quickly where there was a careers marketplace of here's people that are looking for jobs, I'm looking for jobs, right? So that digital marketplace was alive and well. So incredibly proud of that. Number two, we doubled down on Oculuses for our people. We have, since the pandemic, onboarded 120,000 people to our nth floor um, virtual space. That's 120,000 people that have gotten Oculuses and have gotten an experience, an immersive experience to be onboarded, not just via Zoom, but right with others where you can walk in a virtual space and go talk over there with somebody. It's an incredibly crazy experience to be with your little Oculus and be meeting people. It's great, you should try it. And then number three, to touch on something you said, this notion of being truly human came out loud and clear, right? All of a sudden, we were invited into our colleagues homes, right? We got to meet pets, we got to meet daughters, we got to meet sons, we got to meet siblings. We got to understand that we needed to give each other grace in this time as well. And I feel like that grace extends not just for, to us as Latinos, but to everyone else, right? The dad who does need to leave a little early to go pick up somebody from school or to drop somebody off at soccer. I feel like that grace and that humanity that it's reminded us of is so incredibly important and it encourages us to make sure, hey, right, let's bring others along with us and let's make sure that Latinos have a seat at the table. So as I heard your answers, I heard a lot of the humanity part of, and you know, that's encouraging to me as I feel like I'm in a support group with PTSD after the pandemic right now. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I'm like, <laughs> Oh, Jesus, just reliving those moments for what it was for my family and then what I had to do for work and family. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so let's let's declare it over. The pandemic is over. We're over it. OK, so now what are we doing now? OK, so I would like for you guys to talk about uh, what are your respective organizations doing to provide the training and empower your workforce and give them the tools they need to succeed. Whoever wants to go first. Uh, I can chime in. Uh, one of the things that is really clear to me is a role in technology is nonlinear. So I got to run an innovation lab at a Fortune 100 company. I'm a jeweler. So like I made house goods, I renovate houses, like I come from a physical design <coughs> background. Most people would not imagine that. Am I a technologist? Yes, I'm surely a technologist. But I didn't get a degree in technology. Okay, that is not where I started. Um, Capital One has recognized that, that all jobs today require some degree of technology, but 
not every graduate is a technologist. Not everyone's a computer scientist. That doesn't mean their insight, their intelligence, their intellect shouldn't be involved in creating the new forms of technology. So we developed this program called CODA, which is the Capital One Developer Academy. And we take students or recent graduates um, who don't have a computer science background and put them through six months of intense training. And then they become an engineer at Capital One and they sit amongst our best engineers. Um, that transformation to recognize that like anyone can be a technologist I think is groundbreaking and more and more companies need to do that because we have so many technology needs. That <coughs> so many people go into their early years in their career and don't know if they want to be a computer scientist and don't want to dedicate that time there. They'd rather study art like I did <laughs> or human geography like I did. Um, and I want to make sure that we have a workforce that is super well-rounded but has the skills that we need so the CODA program is one that I just think takes that, that we, we invest six months into training them. So they're not building tech for us. Oh. We are educating them in those six months. And then they sit side by side with our engineers. And I've watched some of our uh, CODA graduates, some of them are in the room today, um, just develop as technologists. And then they tell the story. And, and when we think about it in the Latino family, like, you know, I work at a bank, I've worked at a bank for 10 years. When my relatives heard I worked at a bank, they assumed I worked as a, a bank teller. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with being a bank teller. Absolutely not. Um, I'm a vice president at a bank. Mm -hmm. That's not the career that's assumed of Latinos when we say we work at a bank. Mm -hmm. Because the assumption is, well, we don't have the training, the skills, the leadership. It's like, no, 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 you can get them, and it can take six months. And then you could be building the technology our financial world lives on. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, that's super powerful. I, you know, I think the for for Dell, if and if I if I understand the question correctly, around what are we doing uh, in terms of continuing to develop and empower our, our communities? For for us, it starts with culture, right? And I think that's the base and that's the foundation, the the, the people strategy, the culture, the principles that we operate by within our organization, how we hold each other accountable as team members. Uh, what's right, what's wrong, ethics, uh, morals, things of that nature. And without that, then anything else that you're going to do is going to fall flat in terms of development. So you can add program after program after program, but if you have a toxic culture, uh, that's not going to work. And so we spent, have spent over, over the years an inordinate amount of time in terms of what is that definition of the principles that we hold ourselves accountable for as the bedrock and then what are the other things that we need to do within our organizations to ensure that we retain, we acquire, and develop? Uh, the company has a percent of uh, responsibility for that in terms of curating experiences and such. But then it's you and I as individuals have the majority of the responsibility to ensure that we're inquisitive, that we're curious, that we don't stand on our laurels. There are always, uh, you know, taking the concept of learning organizations or learning theory, around accelerating, what I learned today isn't going to be good enough tomorrow, uh, to be well read, to, to, to build network, and to also be contemporary and, and understand for the practice that you're in, what is it that is the next generation? Knowing that technology is alive and well, uh, ML, AI, robots, whatever, yes, they're here, they're coming, they're going to take your job. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. But, but to be contemporary today, you have to always be learning, always be edging, and then taking advantage of what your organization provides you, whether it's hypo skill development coursework, whether it's functional technical skills, whether it's broad, more general social skills, uh, and that is there for most organizations, especially large organizations. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, for us, it's culture, uh, ensuring that we created a culture that everybody, regardless of the walk of life, can come into your organization feel confident, feel comfortable, feel that they can be their authentic selves, and then do their best work in the provision to our partners and our customers, and then also ultimately to themselves, and rely that our company is going to do the right things by them. I'd love to build on that, actually. Absolutely. So Julie Sweet, our CEO, right? Fortune 500 CEO woman of over a 700,000 person organization. She was asked, What's the one piece of advice that you would give somebody that aspires to be in a leadership position someday? And her one answer was, be a lifelong learner. 
it is so incredibly important that we all continue to push ourselves and continue to learn. To be super tactical, she has this thing that she says that every quarter she sets for herself a learning goal, and she makes sure that her team, if you're in a leadership position, your team also has a learning goal, right? So incredibly important. So of course at Accenture we have a huge library of like trainings that you can take for yourself. But one thing that we recently instituted was something called TQ. So you've all heard of EQ and how important that is in business. So TQ is now your tech quotient. And the entire company has had to take these training sessions, which you can test out of, or you can take like a three hour super interactive training session. We were actually just talking about that before. Right now the goal sits at eight. Everybody needs to take eight of these. AI, data, quantum, your blockchain, your choice, but you need to get deep on a topic and really know it well and be conversant in it. So incredibly, incredibly important. The other thing that we do from a company standpoint is there's actually a Skills to Succeed web website out there that we have for the public. You guys can all have access to it. And you can go there and learn about digital skills. You can learn about your CV, interviewing skills, right? So it's about paying it forward to and giving back. So it's not just training our own people and making sure that we're successful, but also helping the community, right? And making sure that if anybody's interested in a technology job, that there's a site out there where you can get smart on how to interview effectively, key digital skills, et cetera. So incredibly important to be lifelong learners. I'm totally with you on that. That's great. I guess we've been um, doing three key things. One is a lot of the member agencies were doing workforce training, uh, but it was kind of the traditional workforce training didn't really involve digital skilling, and so we've tr tried to entice them with grants and um, curriculum to really start to focus more on these digital skill sets. We uh, in in inventoried the uh, area employers around the different nonprofits to find out what the employers were looking for in terms of skill sets, and then we developed a coursework that really responded specifically to the skill set that those employers were, were seeking, and then uh, provided that curriculum as well as the computers and internet connectivity to the nonprofits to teach the courses, to do it both remotely as well as in person as things got better. Um, so that's one big uh, task. As I mentioned, we are up to about 42 locations. We're hoping to grow that initiative to 100 nonprofits by the end of this 2023. So it's a, a, a big um, effort on our part. Uh, the second thing is really connecting those same nonprofits up to this these new uh, programs that the federal government is, is, is pushing out there. There's something called the Digital Equity Act, which is to do a lot of exactly the same type of work that the nonprofits are doing now where we're doing digital skill sets and training folks, helping people take advantage of the digital economy. And so we want to make sure that they're plugged into those opportunities. So we're really working to ensure that they're talking with their state leaders. These are kind of state by state initiatives. So we want to make sure they're engaged in that whole discussion of digital equity within their states. And then the third thing is uh, for individuals, we think it's really important to help keep people continue to get connected. There's a program called the um, Affordable Connectivity Program that the Federal Communications Commission runs which provides a $30, um, you know, in essence, subsidy to a broadband connection in the home, really making um, internet affordable for the first time for many families. And a lot of, uh, of internet service providers have actually come out with $30 a month plans so that the actual end cost for the families is zero dollars um, if they can get that uh, ACP program. It's pretty, pretty open that you, you have to be at least 200% uh, of the poverty level or lower. Um, or to have some sort of means-tested federal benefit that you're getting. Um, but it's open to a large uh, percentage of the Latino community. So what we're doing is going out there to the communities and just making sure people are aware of it. A lot of times it takes a while to get the, the, the news about a new benefit out to, driven out to people. And so really trying to ensure that they're aware of this, that it's different than the ones before, and it's a great opportunity to get internet connectivity for your family. Most of the plans are unlimited. and. Uh, data and pretty fast, and so it's important that they can get that connection so they can do the type of uh, distance learning and mm -hmm. remote work yeah. that uh, we're talking about at the panel. Excellent. As we move into our next question, I would like to see from our uh, participants here, by show of hands, how many of you are currently in a tech job? Okay, thank you. Um, by show of hands, how many of you would like to get a job in the technology field? Okay. Excellent. So here we go. <laughs> Let's connect you. Let's make that happen, right? So um, our next question is, what are your organizations doing to recruit and retain more Latinos? Um, 
I think uh, Jennifer spoke a little bit about reimagining degrees. You know, you don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to, you know, at Capital One at least. Um, so let's talk about what are your organizations doing for that to retain and recruit more Latinos into the tech field. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, and so really, kind of the overall strategy, uh, and, and the pandemic has actually, in, in a silver lining way, been helpful uh, to expand the aperture of where we recruit where if you think about uh, pre-pandemic and, and kind of traditional recruitment, uh, your corporate headquarters, your, your major brick and mortar hubs, uh, that's where we recruited to. And so as an example, if you live in San Francisco and you applied for a marketing job, uh, traditionally we might have relocated you to, to Boston or Austin or wherever. Uh, pandemic has said, enough with that, right? Flexibility, uh, you know, outcome versus place. And so that's given us really kind of great license to, to go and recruit in geogra uh, geographies or metropolitan areas that we never had before. Uh, and not a lot of people want to move to Austin, right? Sometimes uh, I'm saying that as a play political announcement, don't move to Austin. It's too, <laughs> it's too big now, right? But, uh, but again, it, people feel comfortable in the, in the places that they live. And we want to give people that opportunity. So we broadened that aperture. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, different things that we do within the communities to try to do uh, really kind of more outreach is how do we look at early in career? How do we look at our undergraduate graduate? How do we look at some different ge uh, geograph or, or uh, different partnerships? And so a couple of programs come to mind. One is Changing Face at Tech. And this is a group of Hispanic serving institutions, uh, HBCUs, partnered with Dell executives. So as an example, I'm on the board of North Carolina Central University uh, on their advisory board. And so what we do is we've, uh, we've, we've taken senior executives, partnered them with the different programs, get to know the faculty, administration, get to know the students where they're at, uh, you know, really kind of lighten up our, uh, our alumni base and our Dell employees that you went to those schools, go on to campus, and then really kind of do a lot of outreach and, and brand and get people interested in technology in Latino or Hispanic serving institutions and African American or underrepresented minorities. That's a scaled program, right? And then there are other things that we're doing in the communities like uh, uh, Girls Who Game, right? And this is a, a program in partnership with Microsoft and with Intel to where we are going into, uh, you know, earlier in career high school, other, and with the partnerships with, with these other companies, working with these young ladies to, in game, to teach them or introduce them to technology, introduce them to STEM, uh, try to get them uh, early, early, early. And, and again, in that early career, even going further into the sophomore year of college and into the high schools with different scaled programs, really to just kind of build, build the awareness uh, with that technology is not scary, to your point. You don't have to be a technologist to work at a technology company. Uh, if, again, I'll use a, you know, my, 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 my CEO, Michael. Michael has, doesn't have a degree. Right? Uh, and he started the company in technology uh, and has grown it to, this, uh, to the size today. So you know, a lot of different things that, that we're doing in terms of outreach earlier in career in the communities. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's really kind of our responsibility. Uh, and we have uh, you know, stated goals or stated uh, you know, direction that, of how we want our, in the United States, underrepresented minorities to, to be represented within our, within our organization. Michael chairs our Global Diversity Council. Uh, and that is basically a body of executives that is on an ongoing basis looking at how we're doing and the scorecard of that and ensuring that we have the right representation of Latinos, of African Americans, and any walk of life within our organization. Because if you don't do that as a company, you will lose as a company, period, end of story. The communities that we do business in, we have to be representative of those communities and it's extremely important for us to do. And we measure it. So. 100%, so two quick things. You need to measure so we have public numbers out there saying this is where we are today this is where we want to get and we're holding ourselves responsible for getting there not just in total numbers but also what are the numbers of the latinos in leadership positions how many managing directors do we have how many in the c-suite right holding ourselves accountable at every step of the way and number two we're starting to question some of the um, requirements for coming into our company so for example we just launched an apprenticeship program Maybe you don't need a four-year degree to start a technology career. Maybe we can train you on the job, right? Back to if you don't have the right degree, 
come, right? We'll train you. There's on-the-job training, there's virtual training, there's all sorts of ways for you to learn. Let's expand the aperture of opportunity so that more individuals come into technology fields. And to your point, let's partner with organizations that are in the communities to help individuals, you know, if they see it, they can be it, right? It's okay, you don't, have, you don't need to be a techie, you don't even need to be an engineer. You can be in technology. Um, so making sure that that word is out there is so incredibly important. Kept it short in case you guys want to. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll chime in really fast and say like, to me this is about the pipeline of technology professionals and people say like, oh, that starts in college. No, it does not. It starts in elementary school. We have a coders program. We've sent thousands of technologists into elementary schools to introduce technology to kids. Because if you see it, you can believe it, right? If you see a Latino technologist walk in the room and teach you how to make a mobile app, then in five years, you might say like, hey, maybe I, I should, that. yeah, maybe I should have a job in technology. So like when we think about our pipeline at Capital One, we're not thinking just college, you know, colleges. We are working with Hispanic serving institutions and I'm really proud of our partnership with the University of Puerto Rico. Um, but like we are trying to figure out how do we get them real early in recognizing technology is in their life and that they can use that to support their passions, their careers, and their family. Um, so we do that and then we take it all the way through. I get to run Hispanics in Tech. It's the joy of my job. I have a lot of fun jobs at Capital One, but this is definitely the funnest. Um, we have three different groups. We run uh, our, a recruitment group to help our associates bring in other Latinos that look like them. We have a development group to allow every single level of our associates to get the specific support they would need. Um, and then we have an engagement group to allow us to figure out like, how do we actually build community? The pandemic's been really hard. Latinos like to get together. Our chapters can't get together <laughs> until now. <laughs> like we're trying to overcome that. So these are the things that like I feel really proud of um, day in and day out of what we get to do. I guess just, just one additional thing that we do besides the digital skilling is we provide stipends to, or I guess, to, to the graduates. So if you go through one of the eight month programs and um, you have a willing employer, we'll actually pay for the first three months of a, of a salary. To get the person in the door, we consider that a continuation of the training because they'll be learning on the job. And then we found that the success rate for placement is much higher if we're able to provide that stipend. Uh, to get folks going. And then I do, I do want to thank these great companies here because many of them are working really hard to um, increase diversity within their companies. We try to highlight the good players and let the community know that you know these are companies that are working hard to do that. There are companies out there that don't make an effort to try to recruit diverse talent. And it's important for us as consumers to realize when you've got a good company that's making an effort to be inclusive um, and you've got a company that doesn't, I think the companies that don't really should, don't don't uh, earn our business, and they shouldn't be supported by the community. So um, we try to, you know, through organizations like ASEF, uh, which is the Hispanic Association of Corporate Responsibility, really try to, you know, um, you know, document the good players and highlight who's been working hard to earn our dollars and encourage our community to be um, supportive of the companies that are doing well. Excellent. Thank you all. So we are at the time of Q and A. I did have one more question. I may save that for our closing remarks, but I do want to give, we do want to give an opportunity to any questions in the audience. This is your time. You got them right here in front of you. So please feel free. And we have one right here. The, the mic is coming to you. If you would introduce yourself and then your question. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. My name is Julio and I work at uh, NVG. We're a lobbying firm, but my question is, uh, first of all, thank you for your leadership in this issue. Um, technology and the workforce is a, uh, um, you know, we, we kind of see it like as an American-centric type of deal, especially with technology. But developing countries are also in this as well. I'm wondering if organizations or your companies are doing anything in developing countries to ensure that they're also, um, you know, upskilling, uh, you know, getting new skills, um, or is it just, uh, you know, U.S. centric at the moment? Thank you. Who would like to take the, the question? I'll just, my, unfortunately, we're mainly focused in the U.S., Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands. We don't really do outside of uh, the United States as of yet. Um, but there are organizations that do, international nonprofits that are focused on, um, you know, 
Carlos Slim, for example, in Mexico has got a, um, a pretty robust uh, technology center network himself and has created a lot of the same skill sets, classes that we have. They've got it in Spanish as well in Mexico. So, so there are other nonprofits, but not us, unfortunately. So we do have something called the, um, I believe it's consultant development program. And so our, our consultants can um, apply for consulting um, uh, jobs or opportunities overseas. And those are typically with NGOs or governments across the world to help, right? either provide skills or provide, you know, I, one of my colleagues went and helped out at a um, hospital overseas, another colleague went and provided help to a community in terms of skilling and in terms of business opportunities there. Um, and so there is... So the robots are coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there... <laughs> we do that, um, and we do provide um, that at like you know at a, at, at a discount. Like we don't charge full prices for that type of thing. It's sort of we put some of the money, they put some of the money. It's a public pri private partnership in a way. Do any of your organizations have any programs that um, international help international? Look, I mean, it's, uh, Dell is a global company. Uh, we operate all over the world, and so you know the primary commentary from. What I've been talking about today is, again, addressing the Latino community here in the United States. But that isn't uh, the only thing. Obviously, as a global company, you have to have similar uh, initiatives, similar uh, you know, focus areas in the, the places that you do business in. Right? And so we have big presence in India. We have big presence in Malaysia. Uh, we have a large presence in Southeast Asia uh, and some other uh, you know, you know, you know, countries that that do need uh, uh, our expertise, our help, uh, our outreach in terms of building that pipeline in those countries too. So do I have all the specifics? I don't, but I know as a global company we do. And when I travel internationally, we do a lot of things outside in terms of our uh, community service, in terms of our outreach, in terms of the schools, in terms of what we do, uh, in terms of you know, things like getting technology into centers where people may not have technology and make investments like that. Uh, don't have the, the details and specifics, but uh, more than happy to follow up and, and give you that. Excellent. Do we have another question from our from our audience? Good morning. My name is Francisco Cartagena. Um, I work for the city of Gaithersburg as an IT project manager, but like many of my millennial uh, fellows, uh, I do other things on the side to uh, make sure I keep uh, paying those student loans. Um, <laughs> my question to the panel is, you know, once you got in tech, um, I've faced some barriers uh, about the degree is the only reason why you got in. You really don't know anything because you don't have hands-on experience. So that's side of comment, um, despite being the only Latino in the office. So just from your take and your professional experience, how did you navigate that? And was it like, look for another job? Or, <laughs> um, you know, so, and the other question to that is, and, and I'm sorry if I'm taking somebody else's time, at what point did you decide, I'm a good enough technologist to branch out on my own and do my own thing, and I don't need to be there anymore? Um, and, and that's perhaps not necessarily a, a business driven question, but, um, you know, whoever wants to take it. Thanks. Oh, so I, I'll start with your second question, which is, um, yeah, I, I'm a, I, I graduated from Stanford with a, a design degree, and I say I did what every good Stanford student does. I like was 24 and raised venture capital to start a business, and I'd worked one job before then. Um, so I'll just call out that like uh, having the courage to explore things you're passionate about is is important to navigate life, and you can do it in your work field, you can do it in your personal life, like. Ex exploration with the ex without needing to have every bit of it be successful, I think is, is important. My startup, Race and Venture Capital, we were not successful as a business. <laughs> um, did it give me the training ground in technology to get to do what I do? Absolutely. Would I start another company? Absolutely. Um, so there's a, a bit of navigation. In the world of technology, because you are na naturally building new stuff, the implication is it's not all sorted. <laughs> So like you're never gonna feel as if you know every single thing 
that you need to in order to, to be 100% successful. Um, it's about having that learner mindset we've been talking about, consistently learning new things, having conversations with the people pushing yourself, so that way when you encounter that next problem, you have the equipment within you to go solve it. And that's, that, that's very different than like feeling ready. I never feel ready to do anything, but then you gotta move forward. Um, so I think like just having that mindset as, as a technologist, I think, and just like navigating life will be um, really important. And then how do you like accept your seat in the room? This is something I talk to a lot of my Hispanics and tech associates about. Um, you're here, welcome. You are already chosen. Just because you're in the room means that someone, maybe it was just you, but someone believed <laughs> that you have the skill set to be here. And no one really should question that. Um, that's the like step one. Like you are already here. It might be, have been hard to get here, but like use that as the, the motivation every single day to say like that snide comment. Yeah, I don't need to listen to that because you know where I am? I'm here. I'm here with you and you and you. And all of us get to have an opinion, and that's why you're here. And I keep reminding folks of that because there is uniqueness in each of us that we bring. Um, and I say, like, we're all, I'm always trying to capture the magic in the room. Um, if we all were robots, there would be no magic in the room. Mm -hmm. So, like, your unique gifts may not necessarily come through to someone else, and they might have stereotypes about you and, and your training. Um, you are already in the room, and your job is to capture the magic in the room today. And I don't know what that is for you and how you'll show up with other people, but I believe it. Excellent. Um, I would like, uh, if there's one more question, I believe we have time for one more question. Um, please, on this side. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I had a question uh, because I'm still a student. I'm in my senior year of undergrad and I'm majoring in chemistry, but I would like to break into tech. So my question to you, um, to you all, especially for the apprenticeship program and the CODA program, um, what are you all looking for in applicants and what is the curriculum like in order for you to um, graduate and what is it like in regards um, to, to graduating in your program and then uh, transitioning into being an engineer or working with your company. Okay, I'll, get, I'll start and then hand it over to you. So from our standpoint, we're looking for individuals that have that spark of wanting to continuously learn, number one. Number two, do you like to solve problems? It's that simple, right? Do you like to solve problems? Um, for a lot of the interview questions that we give, we give case questions. And so it's about, hey, here's a real business issue that we've had to solve. How would you solve it? How would you tackle it, right? And can you walk me through your thought process of tackling an issue? Again, not everything will be, not everything is said, right? We don't know all the answers, but how do you tackle those issues and show me how you think through an issue and a problem? That's pretty much it. The rest we can teach you. The rest we can totally teach you, not a problem, and or you can learn on the job. So again, I think for us it's not, I think it's like two weeks or X weeks of training, depending on you know what level you come in at. It's like a month of training or a month and a half of training, and then that's it. We expect you to learn on the job, and we expect for you to continuously learn and be curious with your career. Um, that's, I'm gonna stop there. That's a little bit about us, but happy to talk to you. Uh, <clears throat> similar, uh, you know, I, I think it's what we, what you don't want to represent yourself as. Uh, so an individual that uh, is needed needs a paint by numbers. Everything lined up detail by detail, your day detail by detail, because in our industry it's dynamic and things change uh, on a regular basis. So we're really looking for people that are nimble, uh, people that are able to deal with ambiguity, people that are able to deal with uh, really kind of adversity. Uh, you know, it's, it's more a mindset than anything. Uh, it's really kind of this notion of an owner mentality, right? And so if it was your company, the decisions that you make as an owner are fundamentally different from the decisions that you make as a, an employee, right? And so do you have that spark to continue to 
you know, you have a task. Are you going to deliver on the task or are you going to over deliver on the task and give me facts and alternatives? And, and again, take it to that next step. Uh, everything else, and university is important, education is important, not saying that. On the job and how adult learn, adult learn adults learn 70% by doing, 20% uh, and 10% and by classrooms and other stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, organizations are geared and set up to, unless it's a very technical field or something like that, to, to build your skills as you grow your career in the different experiences that you have. We're looking more for a mindset, an attitude, uh, things like that. And then really strong work ethic, work hard. Yes, and I'll just go into the like, what do we do? We, for, for our development program, so the CODA program, it's six months of developer training. So we teach you how to be a developer. And I think that's like a, a big difference is it's, it's, we are teaching you the foundational engineering skills and then like teaching you languages. Because at the end of the program, we want to put you on a team so that way you can build. And when and I consider myself a maker, we're all makers in some capacity. Um, some of us use coding languages to build technologies. So we want to equip you with everything you'd need in order to make on day one. Excellent. Thank you so much. We're going to move to our closing remarks. Thank you for your questions as well. And um, if you might make them brief, but this is very important. Um, what is next in your organizations to advance the digital workforce for Latinos, Hispanics, BIPOC communities? What is next? What are you thinking would be the next step or maybe a next program you guys are working on? So for us, we look at the number of Latinos that need digital skilling. There's currently about 15.5 million Latinos that don't have the digital skill sets to be as competitive as they need to be in today's economy. That's a lot, and we think it's really critical to try to scale up to be able to deliver um, the types of skilling that folks need. So we're pledging to grow our technology center network now to 100 locations by the end of 2023. We're also going to take the curriculum and make it available online, kind of like you've done. So I'm looking forward to looking at yours as well, um, so that people can take the classes asynchronously um, to get access to it. And then we're really working to make sure that the historic investments um, in broadband deployments and in digital equity reach the Latino community. Um, we're fearful that it might not. Um, just like the tech industry, Latinos are underrepresented. Even in the kind of tech advocacy world, Latinos are underrepresented. And that means that a lot of the advocates out there aren't thinking, oh, the, you know, we really should make sure the Latino community is included in these programs, even though when you look at the digital divide, the largest segment of the digital divide is really Latino and African American um, people of color. So, so there's a danger that if we don't knock on the doors of these state offices and say, our community is not being served currently, let's do something about it. Um, that the funds and the resources could go somewhere else. It's no, there's no guarantee it's going to get to where it's needed the most. So we're trying to make sure that the communities are aware of this opportunity and at the same time the need to really make, be vocal to get in front of the policymakers and make sure that this historic investment does reach the communities that need it the most. I would build on that and say I, I love all of that. I agree. Um, I think we need to push up and pull up and be bold, right? I think we, a lot of the things we've been talking about are characteristics that are kind of natural to us. We overcome challenges, we're constant learners, we like to push ourselves, and we gotta push up and pull up the next generation. So for us, I, I would point to two things. Number one, the apprenticeship program, and let's open that aperture of who can come into a technology role and try to you know, make sure that more individuals can join us, even if they don't have the right degree or don't have the technology degree. Let's help everyone get in. Selfishly, within Accenture, I want our Latinos at Accenture to be successful. And I want to hold our leaders accountable for making sure that our people are finding pathways to leadership at Accenture and that they feel that they belong so that they can bring their true selves to work every single day. That's another passion of mine, right, with the Hispanic American ERG. It's about how do we help our people find their right place within the company and how do we hold our leaders accountable for helping them be successful and get to the managing director ranks and above. 
Yeah, so at Capital One, we've been going from that. I talked about like we're literally training elementary schoolers to be technologists, and we're getting college students, and then we're training folks that don't have degrees, and we're supporting our associates. Um, all of that is to support the pipeline. We got to keep doing that because we have many, many years of pipeline management to get us to the numbers we want. But another thing that we've been looking at is how do we actually record the inventiveness of our Latinos? So if you look at patent numbers, I love statistics, so I'm going to hit you with another one. Um, patent numbers held by Latinos in the United States, 10.9%. Again, how many Latinos in the United States? 18.9%. Um, Latinos are incredibly inventive. We have not been able to document their inventiveness in the world of technology. Patents are exceptionally important for transforming the way in which we build. So we have a really robust patent program at Capital One where we try to make every single person at Capital One a patent holder. We've been hitting our Latinos very hard. Why is that? Because when our Latinos are making the technology and inventing the the ideas that will you know, fund and, and, and be the underpinning of what the future of finance looks like, the Latino voice is represented. So yes, we've got to keep fixing this pipeline, but we are also trying to figure out how do we elevate those voices and ensure that they are documented for their inventiveness for our future. Because 100 years from now, you can see those patents and see Jennifer Lopez has one. And that, like changing the, na the narrative of Latinos' inventiveness will also help this pipeline long term. Uh, I go back to culture. Again, that's the foundation and the bedrock of, of any organization. Uh, so we will continue to maintain a, a healthy culture uh, and then scale the solutions that we have today, scale the programs that we have today. Again, uh, you know, to the commentary, uh, you know, we're, we have point solutions. We need to scale those point solutions. And then ultimately, it's measurement, measurement, measurement. Uh, are we making progress? What does our attrition look like? What does the progression rate look like, et cetera? Uh, but I think for the most part, most companies are moving in the right direction. It's just gotta be scaled, and it comes back to each and every, each and every one of us to help pull along our colleagues. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I hope you feel inspired, motivated. Um, if I may share briefly something that may not start as like making sense, but I was working until 11 o'clock last night with my nine-year-old who's doing a project on Rosa Parks, and in Spanish, nonetheless, okay? So I got to learn so much about Rosa Parks because I had to do the research with her. And one of the things that struck me is Rosa Parks sat, stood her seat, that was her seat. I didn't know that. I, you know, I just didn't know the details. That was her seat. She was assigned that seat. She stood her seat five days after she learned of Emmett Till's killing and lynching. If you're not familiar with that, the, the movie's coming out, Till is coming out. I encourage you to, to, to read more about it. I'm saying because I learned. And the reason that struck me right now is because she learned she found boldness and courage in the people who came before her. These are some of the people who've gone before you. Maybe you're standing with them right now. But if you need that encouragement and, and just boldness, uh, they're right here, ready to talk to you. And they're our Latino voices representing Latino and Hispanic uh, organizations. So please do, do find what you need and access. They're right here. So can we please give a, a round of applause to all of them?